according to Mark, the sixth chapter. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to the land to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people once again at once recognized him and rushed about the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplace and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 
Well, the pop quiz question of the day is, if you could say two things about what makes a good leader, what would they be? Quiz. Nobody respond. Good leader. Hmm? A good listener? Empathy, listening, empathy, other things about good leaders. A vision. Hmm? Service, a servant, visionary, empathetic listener, anything else? Other things that make good leaders, Mary? A good shepherd, okay. You listen to the readings, see, she gets an A. <laughs> anything else making a good leader? Honesty. Honesty. Okay. What was that? I couldn't hear it. Okay. Okay. Well, this is very much the question when you talk about the good shepherd. Uh, on the one hand, when you hear shepherd, and in King James it was actually translated as the good pastor, uh, the person who took the sheep to pasture. Uh, in other translations, it could be, uh, as you hear it, the good shepherd, the one who tends the sheep. But uh, it often was the image that was used for the king, for the leader, for the person who's in charge, for the one who is guiding and, and leading the people. So the question, what qualities make a good leader? And what are the qualities to which you aspire to when you are called upon to lead? It's very much an issue in these readings today. When you heard the gospel, did you hear it when Jesus got out of the boat and looked at all the people who were rushing to meet with him and he had compassion for them? Compassion, one of my favorite Greek words, his known, got riled up in his bowels, his stomach turned out of sympathy for them. Uh, whoever said empathy, if you have that idea, of, he related to them because they were like sheep that had no shepherd. Or when you look at Jeremiah, he says, woe to the shepherds. He's talking to people who, after being exiled, after the destruction of their country, of their city, Jerusalem, are in Babylon as, as uh, captives, as slaves, as people who are in in, uh, have been taken from their homes and placed there. He says, woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Woe to the leaders. They dropped the ball. They, they screwed up. They, they really were destructive. And as a consequence, the people got scattered, not only those in Babylon, but you found Jewish communities who fled Jerusalem from Ethiopia up into Europe. All over the world they were scattered because of the breakdown in leadership that had occurred. If you, it is you who have scattered my flock, who have driven them away, says uh, Jeremiah, and you have not attended to them, so will I attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. I myself will gather. I will get in the business of gathering the remnant, he says. I will raise up new shepherds. I will raise up new leaders for them who will shepherd them, who will lead them, and they will reign as kings with wisdom. And there'll be two attributes that they embody. As they practice this wisdom, they will execute mispot, and tzedakah in Hebrew. Mishpat is the idea that they will be people who can arrive at a judgment and carry it out. They know how to make decisions. There are people who can evaluate and assess situations. They can figure out what needs to be done and make a decision and initiate the action. They will execute, he says, they will execute justice in that sense. But then it gets coupled with this other Hebrew word, tzedakah, which is often translated in one of two ways. In the King James Version, that's what's translated as justice. Here it's translated as righteousness in the sense that, that it is a relational word. It is that which sustains right relationships between God and people and between people with one another. This tension of living a life that is faithful to the Lord, but 
lives in constant awareness of the relationships and what one does to sustain one's relationships with the people around you. That is a sign, according to Jeremiah, of the good shepherd, the one who is able to, to make judgments, arrive at judgments, make decisions, and act upon them, at the same time bringing and keeping all those relationships as they should be, keeping them right as relationships. Not an easy thing to do in our world, if it ever was. Uh, you find that, and he says that, that now the task is to bring all these scattered people, all the people who have been scattered from Jerusalem and Israel, bring them together back into right relationship and so that we can move forward as people. It says, this uh, section of Jeremiah concludes that, uh, that, that, that God, that this good shepherd is the righteous. It, that it is actually in the Hebrew, Jehovah the righteous or the tzedak. It is Jehovah the maintainer of relationships. That becomes the key. And, and that becomes the theme that runs into, spills into Ephesians as Paul is writing to to these people in Ephesus in the Greek world where they are not part of the family. He's writing and starts out talking about you are uncircumcised in a world of the circumcised. In that world, you were either an insider or you were outsider. You were a Greek or a barbarian. You were a Jew or you were a Gentile. You were either welcome or you weren't welcome at all. And Paul writes to them and he's describing to them that they were the people who were once far off and now have brought, been brought near by the blood of Christ. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us that he might create in himself one new humanity, the grand vision. One new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace. And they might reconcile groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting death that, uh, that, to death that hostility that existed through it. Grand visions. Grand visions that today, 2,000 years later, might be spelled out as, as a complete end of, of racial segregation or discrimination or prejudice. Uh, it, it, the universal declaration that all might marry those whom they love, uh, the immigration reform that seems so elusive that finds a way to bring people into right relationships through good decision making, the vision that probably we all kind of think is so unattainable that we don't even bother to yearn for it much of the time. It seems so elusive in a divided world, in a hostile world, the world that Paul describes, the world that Jeremiah describes, the world that Jesus takes note of. And yet you could say this is the vision into which we are all called. And it's a grand vision. But so often, you could look at it and say, just wait a while. Let's keep moving this way. Things will work their way out. But Jesus is confronted by a situation where people just can't wait because their needs are so great. You know, after uh, last week we read about the beheading of John the Baptist, and this week the disciples have returned to talk about all that they've done and all that they've taught. And we skipped over a bunch of verses about how Jesus had started teaching these people who were like the scattered sheep, the sheep that didn't have the shepherd, and he began to teach them. And he taught them so long, and so many people stayed around and listened that there was no food. And so he told the disciples they needed to find some food to feed the people. And they found those loaves and those fishes, and they shared them. And there were so much left over that they collected more baskets of food than they had given out. The story of feeding of thousands of people or the fear that the disciples experienced in that boat crossing the sea when, when everything was so turbulent. And Jesus walks across the water and eases fear. Fear, hunger, Maslow's hierarchy of needs that you need food, shelter, you need uh, uh, safety, 
You need to feel like you're healthy. Uh, you need clothing. And only when those basic needs are met can you aspire to higher things, to grander visions, they say. Uh, two scholars at Princeton and Harvard have been studying that, that when you are needy, they can measure the fact that your IQ will drop when you feel that you do not have, even when it's just time, when I don't have time, when I am, is there anybody here that has all the time they need? When you feel deprived of time, your IQ drops, such is the impact. And so when these people come to Jesus and they see that he's there and they're coming person by person, being carried out of their villages to come out to him so that they might touch his garment, and be healed. Jesus doesn't say to them, no, you have to wait. The vision hasn't been fulfilled. The mission hasn't been accomplished. We haven't, we haven't successfully achieved our goals or our purposes. We haven't done those good planning things that, that in all good leadership structures, somehow that all comes together. Those things aren't in place, and yet he stops and he reaches and he touches, and people touch him. And it's in that blending of connecting the vision, the desire, the hopes, and the dreams with the reality of the people who are with him. The sadaka, the rightness of relationship that doesn't leave anybody behind, that the gospel comes to life. It's true in the 23rd Psalm, it says, he leadeth me beside still waters. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness. But as the good shepherd leads, we find that there's no reason to fear evil, that we find that his rod and staff, they comfort me. We find that he anoints our heads with oil so that our cups run over. We find that goodness and mercy somehow seem to follow us so that we can be built up and maybe someday have our needs so met that we can truly follow this leader to the realization of these dreams. The dreams when people come together as one. The dreams that unity is accomplished. That those who've been divided and spread across the face of the earth can reconnect and those who've never been part of the franchise, become franchised. Such enormous dreams. But you can't get there alone. And you can't get there if there isn't a hand that reaches out to guide you and shepherd you and help you along the way. This is the Sunday of the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd, Jesus says, knows the sheep and the sheep know him. Those who are blessed know who their good shepherd is. And the good shepherd is the one who brings good news, gospel, to all people. And that is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to you. It's always a pleasure to baptize children. This child is actually, I take particular pleasure, uh, he is a, a, you could say, a product of Washington where his father, Brenton, came to Washington from uh, Nebraska, from the plains of Nebraska. His mother, Liz, from Atlanta. They met playing volleyball in, uh, in Metro DC. Uh, they got married in this church. They uh, uh, have been part of this church. And now we have the offspring, Bolton, who is here to be baptized as they present him to, uh, to our community and as we welcome into this fellowship. In baptism, our gracious Heavenly Father frees us from sin and death, joining us to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are born children of a fallen humanity. By water and Holy Spirit, we are reborn children of God and made members of the church, the body of Christ, living with Christ and in the communion of saints. We grow in faith and love to do the will of God. Called by the Holy Spirit, trusting in the grace and love of God, do you desire, is it your wish and your desire 
that Bolton be baptized into Christ. As you bring Bolton uh, to receive the gift of baptism, you're entrusted with responsibilities to live with Bolton among God's faithful people, to bring Bolton to the Word of God and the Holy Supper, to teach Bolton the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments, and place in his hands the Holy Scriptures, and nurture him in faith and prayer so that he may learn to trust God, proclaim Christ through word and deed, care for others and the world God made, and work for justice and peace. Do you promise to help Bolton grow in the Christian faith and life? Now, Jeff and Christy stand here as godparents, as sponsors, and so I ask them, do you promise to nurture Bolton in the Christian faith as you are empowered by God's Spirit and to help Bolton live in the covenant of baptism and in communion with the church? And people of God, do you promise to support Bolton and pray for him in his new life in Christ? I ask you all to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? Do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? Do you believe in God the Father? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into death. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge us the living and the dead. Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of God. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. We give you thanks, O God, for the beginning. In the beginning, your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through waters of the flood, you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea, you led your people Israel from slavery to freedom. At the river, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By baptism into Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, you set us free, you free us from the power of sin and death and raise us up to live in you. Pour out your Holy Spirit, the power of your living word that he who is washed in the waters of baptism may be given new life. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Okay, yeah. Bolton, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed be God, the Lord of all life, the Word of salvation, the Spirit of mercy. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, through, that through water and the Holy Spirit you give your sons and daughters new birth, cleanse them from sin, and raise them to eternal life. Sustain Bolton with the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Good point, right? Good prayer. The spirit of the fear of the Lord the spirit of joy in your presence both now and forever. Amen. Bolton, child of God, you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Amen. People of God, meet your new brother in Christ, Bolton.
your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. 